Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Amanda Pendergast, who is defending her master's thesis today. And Dr. Pendergast is an assistant professor of family medicine at Memorial University. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and completed her MD at the University of Ottawa. Currently, she practices at the Shea Heights Community Health uh, Center Medical Clinic, where she teaches medical students and family medicine residents. She cares for patients and conducts research. Dr. Pendergast has great interest in obstetrical care and in curriculum development and is very active in these two areas in addition to others. And today she's presenting her thesis entitled Knowledge and Attitudes Towards Breastfeeding Among Memorial University of Medical Students. So please join me in welcoming Amanda. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Terry. So I also wanted to acknowledge my thesis advisory group. So thanks as well as Dr. Terry. Thank you to Dr. Coppola and also Dr. Zwerenstein. So today I'm going to talk about some background that led to my research. I'm going to talk about why I feel my research is important. I'm going to talk about methodology and findings for both of the studies that I completed. I'm going to integrate the two studies and then I'm going to move on to conclusions and recommendations. Breastfeeding initiation is defined as at least one attempt for a mother to breastfeed her baby after the baby is born. Breastfeeding initiation rates in Canada are 89%. Newfoundland and Labrador, however, has the lowest rate of breastfeeding initiation in our country. It's just under 70%. And on top of that, rural areas are about 40%, so much lower than the national average. The benefits of breastfeeding are numerous to both mother and baby. There are short-term benefits and there are also long-term benefits. I wanted to highlight two of the long-term benefits today, and that's reduction in obesity and also reduction in diabetes. And these are two chronic diseases that we see quite commonly in our population. In Canada, prevalence of diabetes is 7.6%. In Newfoundland and Labrador, we have the highest prevalence of diabetes in all of the provinces. We also have the highest prevalence of obesity, both in youth and in adults, and these rates are almost 40%. Traditional ways to help re reduce the burden of these illnesses or reduce the prevalence of these illnesses has um, encompassed lifestyle changes, such as promoting healthy diet and promoting exercise. However, it's important to remember that breastfeeding is another way to help reduce the occurrence of these illnesses in our population. So what can improve breastfeeding initiation rates? There are many factors that can improve, but I just wanted to highlight one today, and that's the knowledge and support of physicians. The knowledge and support of physicians is key to helping promote breastfeeding within a patient relationship. In Newfoundland and Labrador, we know that there's a lack of support within the community. We also know that rural physicians are much less likely to discuss breastfeeding with their patients than urban physicians. I'm quite interested in uh, working with medical students. Most of my role in my academic life is with undergrad medical education, and I really feel that undergrad is the time to establish a really good baseline of breastfeeding. And that can be built on as the students go through residency and go through in their practice, whether they're family physicians or whether they practice in another area. We know that medical students have deficiencies in breastfeeding knowledge, and this has been shown in many international studies and in one study in the United States. There haven't been any studies in Canada, however. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have low breastfeeding initiation rates. We have an increased prevalence of chronic diseases, such as diabetes, which we know breastfeeding is protective against diabetes. We don't have enough support from physicians. And there's a literature gap because we don't know the knowledge and attitudes of medical students in this population. So that brings me to my first study. What are the knowledge and attitudes towards breastfeeding in medical students at Memorial University? This is a quantitative study. So besides assessing knowledge and attitudes, I wanted to also describe and analyze any differences in subgroups. And I was particularly interested in the difference between rural and urban medical students because there's such a difference in rural and urban initiation of breastfeeding in our province. The design was a cross-sectional study there was a self-administered questionnaire which was given online. For sampling, first and second year medical students were included in the study population. Students who were repeating the first or second year were excluded. And we used a tailored design method to help enhance response rates. 
The sample size estimation according to Holly was 156 and we had a response rate of about 23%. The data collection tool that was used was the 90 item Australian Breastfeeding Knowledge and Attitude Questionnaire which was developed by Broad Ribbon Australia. This tool had been previously used on family medicine residents and family physicians so we did reliability and validity assessments because we were changing the population where the sample was being, the study was being administered. And the independent variables, I mentioned those previously. The dependent variables were mean attitude score and mean knowledge score. Each of the individual attitude and knowledge questions had a Likert scale of one to five, where one would be strongly disagree and five would be strongly agree. A higher score would indicate a more positive knowledge and attitude. Statistical analysis, we used SPSS 25.0. We did univariate analysis by looking at descriptive statistics. And we did bivariate analysis. We did a t-test between the different subgroups and the mean attitude or the mean knowledge score. And we also did multiple linear regression to look at the analysis, sorry, to look at the variance. Moving on to the findings, the validity, the construct validity of this scale was 0.49. The reliability, Kronbach's alpha coefficient for the mean attitude score was 0.81, and for the mean knowledge score was 0.48. Looking at the demographics, we had 37 respondents to this study, and I wanted to highlight the fourth one there, breastfed as a child. So we had almost all of the participants in this study were breastfed as a child, about 83%. None of them said they weren't, and six of them said that they weren't sure if they were breastfed or not. Moving into the findings of the descriptive analysis, the overall mean attitude score in this population was 4.14 with a standard deviation of 0.53. And remember, five would be a perfect attitude score. For looking at the individual items, the attitude ranged from 2.84 to a high of 4.89. And on the right-hand side there, I have a couple of examples of some of the individual attitude items, but I'm gonna move on just in interest of time. Looking at the mean knowledge score, the overall mean knowledge score in this sample was 3.93 with a standard deviation of 0.39, and the knowledge ranged from 3.32 to 4.49. You'll also see a number that, another number there that says 66% correct, and when Broadrib did her analysis, she also looked at the percentage of respondents that answered the question correctly. So she defined this as a respondent's either answering a four or a five, which would be a strongly agree or an agree, and divided that by the total number of respondents for the particular question. So if we looked at our study, 66% of the students answered questions correctly, and this ranged from a low of 29.7%, and that was the association, if there was any association with formula and colic, to 97.3%, which is understanding that breastfeeding is very beneficial for moms and for babies. Next, I'm gonna move into the bivariate analysis of the mean attitude score. And we found that three of the subgroups had significant differences between the groups. So the year of medical school, second year medical students had significantly higher attitude scores than first year medical students. The population of the hometown, rural medical students had significantly higher attitude scores than urban medical students, which I was surprised at. And then whether or not they were breastfed as a child. If a medical student was breastfed as a child, the mean attitude score would be higher. Looking at the mean knowledge score, there was only one characteristic that had a significant difference between the subgroups, and that was year of medical school. So second year medical students had a higher knowledge score than first year medical students, even though the curriculum was the same. All of the study had been conducted after they had their breastfeeding lecture in first year. Moving into the multivariate analysis, in analyzing the mean attitude score, the total variance explained by this model was 27.5%, and population of the student's hometown was a significant contributor to this model. And looking at the multivariate analysis for the mean knowledge score, the Variance explained by this model was 3.1%. The strengths and limitations of this study, this was the first study to examine knowledge and attitudes in medical students towards breastfeeding in Canada. 
And it was also a strength that knowledge gaps were identified. So we could use the knowledge scale to look at areas that medical students needed more information in the breastfeeding curriculum, and that could be added to the curriculum. The limitations were the sample size and the internal consistency of the mean knowledge score. I'm going to move into the second study. Are there educational gaps in breastfeeding education within the undergraduate medical program at Memorial University? This was a qualitative study, and I wanted to explore potential gaps of medical education at Memorial, as noted by local breastfeeding educators. This was a descriptive qualitative study. To sample breastfeeding educators, first they were identified by speaking with the undergraduate medical department and finding out who was teaching, also by um, looking at different breastfeeding committees within the hospital, and then by where places of work. So we knew that um, different people who worked in the newborn unit, for example, were going to be more likely to be educating medical students about breastfeeding. We also attempted to have maximal variation in the different participants. So the um, types, there were different types of um, breastfeeding educators who were interviewed. Some had more of a clinical basis, some did more large group discussions with them, some were nurses and some were physicians. And we used a semi-structured interview guide to collect the data. The data was all audio recorded and transcribed verbatim. Independent coding was done by myself with doc and Dr. Terry and then we met to do team coding. After about interview number six we met with Dr. Copula to also do team coding and refine the coding template and then we noted emerging themes that developed and we had sufficient data by interview number 10. So we had 10 participants, six were physicians. We had family physicians and pediatricians. The experience with teaching ranged from six months to 25 years in the physicians. And we also had four nurses. We had some lactation consultants, a nurse educator, and also a nurse who worked on the floor. And experience there ranged from um, a few years to about 25 years as well. There were six major themes that were identified in the study and they're outlined there. I'm going to go to them, to them in detail. And I also am going to highlight the tension between the themes. So the themes didn't occur in isolation, but there was a lot of tension. I'm going to get into that. And there was also a wealth of curricular improvement that came out for the study as well. So the first finding is that the breastfeeding educators noted that the medical students had positive attitudes. Even though they had positive attitudes, there was a naivety towards breastfeeding issues. So the medical students, especially early in their training, felt that there was more of a dichotomy. Breastfeeding is good, therefore everybody should breastfeed. And not really understanding all the nuances that went into it and the, the social reasons why women might not be able to breastfeed or perhaps something in their personal life that might have happened. So participant eight, who is a family physician, said, sometimes the medical students can be very rigid. And okay, these are the guidelines. If you don't follow the guidelines, then why are you here? And the breastfeeding educators also found that medical students sometimes had a discomfort around breastfeeding patients. So instead of using that as an opportunity to learn and observe a latch and observe milk transfer, they felt uncomfortable and they said, you kind of wait here and I'll come back later on. The second theme that emerged is that the breastfeeding educators found that medical students had low levels of knowledge and skills in terms of breastfeeding medicine. They did find that personal experience enhances breastfeeding knowledge, and that wouldn't necessarily be if the medical student was a parent. It could be if the medical student had a close friend or had worked before in an environment where breastfeeding had occurred. And the educators also found that medical students had a lack of confidence. Participant 8 stated, I've had residents and medical students say, you know, I feel a bit like a fraud trying to counsel someone on breastfeeding when I haven't, you know, been through it. The third theme in this study was the attitude of the educators. They often reflected on their own personal breastfeeding experience, and again, this was not necessarily if they were parents or not, but experience that they might have seen with working with breastfeeding patients. They also reflected on their teaching style and sought ways to improve their teaching. Participant seven, a pediatrician, says, I don't take the medical students in with me as much when I do hands-on with the mom. But reflecting back, I should start bringing them in. Instead of me saying, you wait here, I'll go deal with it. And the final theme, or the final sub-theme of the attitudes of educators was introducing breastfeeding into teaching. So they wouldn't kind of separate breastfeeding and talk about breastfeeding and then talk about something else, but talk about how breastfeeding might, inter might interact with another type of teaching. So if they're talking about ear infections, they might say, well, breastfeeding can reduce ear infections in babies. The fourth theme was the breastfeeding educators' findings about the learning environment at Memorial University. They found it was sometimes difficult to integrate the medical students into the clinical team because there's so many different layers of learners and sometimes the rotations are so short. 
Participant 10, who's a lactation consultant, and she works in a breastfeeding clinic where moms would go after they had the baby for help, and medical students would sometimes spend an afternoon with her. She stated, they're watching me, I have to be honest. They are sent in to see what I'm doing, and I don't really get a chance to reciprocate that back to see what they've picked out of it. The breastfeeding educators also found there were sometimes gender differences. And they also found the motivation to learn was not really to get a good clinical basis of breastfeeding medicine, but more what's going to be on the exam next, more focused on assessment. The breastfeeding educators also found there were some impediments to learning at the university. There were structural impediments to learning, again, because of the layered learning and the number of students that were attending an area at any given time. Sometimes it was difficult to do that, especially if the ward was busy. And then not having enough space. So a lack of space to be able to actually conduct a formal type of teaching. There's also a lack of knowledge of the medical school curriculum. And the medical school curriculum at Memorial was completely revamped about five years ago. And even though it's been five years since the changes have been made, a lot of people don't really know where breastfeeding medicine fits in or maybe what objectives need to be covered. So participant four, who is a lactation consultant, stated, I do the clerk teaching during their obstetrical rotation. Yeah, I've been doing that from when I started. Nobody told me exactly what I was supposed to do. And the final theme that emerged was the breastfeeding educator's perspective of the breastfeeding culture in Newfoundland and Labrador. They felt that there was more interest from society, more people were attending breastfeeding clinics or asking about breastfeeding. There was a hope for future physicians in that medical students were showing more interest in breastfeeding. And the physician's role in breastfeeding discussion was still very important. And certainly the family physician's role is quite important as we see patients before they're pregnant, during their pregnancy. So there's lots of time to discuss breastfeeding. Participant five states, so we've done so much work in so many different areas, but we all know it's a physician oftentimes who can make or break that continuation of breastfeeding. I next wanted to move into the different tension between the themes because as I said, the themes didn't occur in isolation and there was a lot of tension that emerged when we did analyze the themes. The first was ba balancing teaching responsibilities with clinical duties and the breastfeeding educators sometimes felt torn about this. They wanted to provide the best care for the patient and also the best learning opportunity for the learner, but sometimes it was difficult to do both of this if there was a, maybe a learner that had extra needs or maybe the ward was very busy or the clinic was very busy and there might be a sick patient. Participant 7, who's a pediatrician, said, so you prep the medical students before they get on the ward because when they get on the ward, it's crazy. There are nursing students, there are a million people, there are four people in a room, it's not the best. There was also the understanding and the tension that even though you wanted to provide a really good learning opportunity for the learners, clinical duty always has to trump teaching duty. And so sometimes when you have a patient, for example, that's very sick, the learning might have to be just kind of by observation. Maybe the medical students, if they're not advanced enough, they can't participate. But this also happened kind of outside the level of the breastfeeding educator. So sometimes it was a hospital, for example, that made a decision. And participant six, who is a pediatrician with over 25 years experience, she was quite frustrated the hospital moved some of the residents to work in the NICU instead of spending time in the newborn nursery. So she said, there's been a shortage with people that work in the NICU. The residents have been seconded to the NICU and they would have less exposure to like normal breastfeeding. And finally, students are challenging educators more. So this particular pediatrician, she does a large group session and she found over the years she's getting more comments from medical students about, you know, is the research, is the research conducted properly, are questions arising from their research, feeling that she's too biased towards breastfeeding. So she's actually had to change her lectures as a result. So she stated, sometimes I would get in the evaluation, I'd get maybe one comment from a student about my lecture being too biased towards breastfeeding. And the final part of the study I wanted to highlight were the curricular recommendations. There was a wealth of curricular recommendations that came from the study. A lot were based on medical expert CanMed's role, so for example, the physiology of breastfeeding or medication safety in breastfeeding. But I thought it was very interesting that a lot of the non-medical expert roles were represented as well. So the first was a patient-centered clinical method. And this comes back to that naivety of the medical students understanding that breastfeeding is really good, but not really understanding that it's not for everyone. So being able to explore breastfeeding with a patient and doing that in a way that's gonna encompass a patient's needs and a patient's interests and what a patient really wants to see out of it, but at the same time, the medical student understanding the best way to deliver the appropriate knowledge. So it was felt that this should occur in pre-clerkship. It could be during a clinical experience. It could be with breastfeeding dyads with a mom and a baby. And the CanMed's roles would be communicator and professional. 
Another non-medical expert CAMED's roles I wanted to highlight were social barriers to breastfeeding. So we know that women from higher socioeconomic status are more likely to breastfeed. Women that are from lower statuses are less likely. So it's, they felt it was very important for the medical students to understand the feelings behind this and why some women had more challenges with breastfeeding. Maybe it was childcare, maybe an unsupportive partner. So again, this should occur during pre-clerkship. It could be a panel discussion or a small group. They felt it was very important to include other disciplines such as pharmacy students and nursing students because everyone would experience this with work. And the CANMED's roles here would be advocate, professional, leader, and collaborator. So the strengths and limitations of the study, we had participants from many academic disciplines, and they had a wide teaching breadth. Some did purely clinical teaching, some did small groups, some did lecture style format. The limitation was the sample profile was concentrated in St. John's. And then next I'm going to integrate both of the studies to highlight the similarities that occurred in both. So both of these studies showed that medical students have very positive attitudes towards breastfeeding. Both studies also showed that medical students have knowledge and skills deficits in breastfeeding medicine. And finally, both studies showed curricular recommendations. So the quantitative study with the medical students showed more content type of um, deficiencies in the curriculum that could easily be added in. The qualitative study also contained content, but also non-medical expert content. Also contained information on timing, so should it be done during clerkship or pre-clerkship? If it's done during clerkship, which rotation would be the best for it? And then pedagogy, should it be a small group discussion? Should it be a hands-on clinical skill? So in conclusion, this is the first study of knowledge and attitudes towards breastfeeding in medical students in Canada. Knowledge gaps in the undergraduate medical curriculum were identified and suggestions given. And I think a really important future study would be program evaluation. And I'm really fortunate. I have a leadership position within the undergraduate program at Memorial. And I mentioned that five years ago, the curriculum was completely revamped. Right now, we're doing a five-year revision of the curriculum. And it's a time that we're kind of looking at differences in timing of things. We're looking at differences in sequencing. We're looking at objectives. So I think this is a fantastic time to be able to implement some of the changes that came out of the study. And again, I'm fortunate I work in undergrad, but I also have a really good relationship with a lot of the breastfeeding educators. And we've already been working together to make some changes in the curriculum. So I think future studies for this would include some program evaluation, some short term and some medium term. And I want to thank you very much for your attention and for coming today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Field questions from the people who are not examiners. Yes. Thank you for a really nice, highly done presentation and Thank you. very interesting research. I'm curious if I understood things correctly from your um, qualitative component that the, the educators, the breastfeeding educators, perceived that there, were, there was a gender difference. Yes. In, I'm not sure in attitudes or knowledge of medical students, but that wasn't found in your quantitative section. No. So I wonder what your thoughts are on, on why that might be. So the gender differences that came up um, kind of came up both ways. So the educators found that the female medical students probably had more access to breastfeeding because they were allowed to stay in the room more with the patients. However, the male medical students had a large interest and they were quite interested in breastfeeding medicine and they probably asked more questions during the small groups. So I wonder if the reason that that didn't come up during the quantitative study is because the quantitative I was looking at mostly first and second years and the qualitative was probably looking more at clerkship. They, I asked questions about the whole spectrum of the curriculum but a lot where that came up were the people that directly work with the medical students during clerkship. So I think that would be interesting maybe if we repeated the quantitative study but included the entire spectrum. I wonder if that might come up then. Does that answer your question? As well as it can. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. answer to that question. I mean, one, one thought you might be that the, the breastfeeding educators are picking up something that the, the survey didn't. Mm -hmm. in Absolutely. Or that um, they're misperceiving things and the survey is more accurate. I it could be too. Yeah. Thank you. Amanda, what year did you do your survey? I only ask because I know that the president of La Lash went through med school <laughs> during the last five years. Oh, okay. Quite a presence. 
Okay, so I, oh gosh, let me think back when I did the survey. The survey, um, I did it in between February and April in, I believe it was two years ago that I did it. Yeah, I think she was gone by then. And then the interviews were done um, this year in the fall, well, last year in the fall, so October, November, December. Yeah, I think that's right, isn't it? 2017? Yeah. <laughs> yes? And then the, I, I think one of the things that you highlight is in the, the, you're bringing up, Maria, is the whole idea of, of context and, and this, that that person could influence the context or the, mm -hmm. the milieu that people are learning in. And, and I, I think that, that Newfoundland and Labrador, are, it's an amazing context unto itself. Mm -hmm. So just, and not so much from, from your research, but I mean, what, what are some of your feelings about, you, know, we, you work in Shea Heights. Yep. It's, it's a tough, tough area. And it is, there's a lot of challenges in Shea Heights, yeah. yeah. And so, so what are some of the challenges that you face in terms of, that, that maybe that your research has helped you understand with your patients in that community? Mm -hmm. For talking about specifically breastfeeding, um, I think it just reinforces that you need to be patient with people. It's a lot like smoking cessation. Like, you know, you say to patients all the time, okay, you need to stop smoking. Yes, I understand that. But to actually break through to them, it's usually not one visit. It's multiple visits and multiple times over the years. And I think it's the same too with breastfeeding. And um, talking about it with patients, you know, when they're coming in and saying, okay, do I need to take folic acid or not? I'm thinking about becoming pregnant. And then later on in the pregnancy, we also have at Shea Heights, we've got a lot of information that's for breastfeeding in the waiting room so they can access that as well. And then um, I stopped doing obstetrics two years ago, but when I used to do obstetrics, we used to do group clinics. And we would have, after 36 weeks, the patients would come meet all the women that did, or all the providers, because we had males as well, that did obstetrics. And um, we would discuss different topics with them. And one of the topics that came up once a month was breastfeeding. So it was another opportunity to kind of have a small group and answer questions that people might have. So I think it's really being patient, trying to understand where they're coming from. And I, I've had patients that haven't breastfed their first two children and then ended up trying it for their third, which mm -hmm. you think that kind of goes against what you would think would actually happen. But mm -hmm. I think just listening is the most important part. Yeah. And, and maybe that's one of the key things that the, the medical students need to learn as well. Yes. Is, is to listen. Yes. And, and, not, and not to judge. Absolutely. Yeah. And to have patience. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much.